welcome everybody and welcome everybody who's going to be tuning in here now shortly on Facebook. Um, this is the Chicago Bruzeum Virtual Happy Hour. Hey, hey. Uh, our a, a virtual pub where we come together, gather, converse, share, and just continue to build community during our time of um, global pandemic and, uh, and distancing. So, you know, we might be uh, physically apart, but socially trying to stay together. My name is Lucas Livingston. I'm on the board of directors with Chicago Museum. And for this uh, hour tonight, um, it's uh, always a pleasure uh, welcoming back Peter, Peter Simons. Peter is a member of the Chicago Museum's League of Historians, dear friend of the Chicago Museum, uh, and uh, multiple repeat guests of the Chicago Museum's virtual happy hour. Uh, here we are tonight, we're going to be discussing the history of stout uh, down under. Peter's a great uh, expert in beer history down under and, and across the world. Uh, and uh, so uh, with that, uh, definitely we're going to ask people to, yeah, who join live on the Zoom to, uh, to mute themselves uh, during Peter's uh, discussion. But then towards the end, we're going to open it up to Q&A. And conversation at that point will invite everybody, anybody who wants to, to unmute themselves, chime in, um, converse, speak. At, you can also unmute your camera at that point as well, too, if you'd like. Um, and uh, otherwise, certainly feel free to use the chat box uh, to share what you're drinking, what you're thinking, ask questions in the chat box. So I'll try to keep on, to on tabs with those. Uh, and then Facebook as well. I'll be monitoring what's going on on Facebook Live and, uh, and, and uh, certainly um, we'll be, we'll be uh, taking questions in, in there as well. So with that though, um, Peter, please, I welcome you. Take it away. Right. Um, you can see the screen okay? Yeah, yeah, it looks great. Peter. Yep. Okay, well off we go then. So my talk today is, is really about stout. In fact, it's all about the dark side. So we'll have a 230 year plus uh, of Australian stouts in about 45 minutes. And we're gonna cover a whole menagerie of animals as we go along. And this particular Wordle slide uh, covers uh, just a few of the ones we're going to touch on as we go through. So we we'll need to look at stout styles just to get everybody on the same page. So styles, they do evolve over time. And I'm going to look at three distinct periods, 19th century colonial, 20th century from Federation, which was 1901, with a major focus on the 20s and 30s. And then we're going to look at uh, the 21st century stout survivors. So we'll just go through a bit of a timeline. So Australia was uh, colonized, invaded in 1788. And you can see on this timeline uh, a selected number of breweries and their establishment dates. And we're going to talk about quite a few of these breweries as we go along. So with the stout context, Toos was the first brewery established in New South Wales and they brewed a double brown stout. And that became a draft double stout over time. Coopers, uh, based in Adelaide, uh, they brewed a Coopers Porter and then a Coopers Stout. Tui's, the other major uh, brewer within the Sydney area, they brewed a brown porter. Uh, down in Albury, which is on the border between New South Wales and, and Victoria, uh, they brewed a stout out in the country. Uh, Cascade, down in, um, in Tasmania, they had an invalid stout. Also an invalid stout uh, from the Macclesfield Brewery in South Australia, a Waverley double stout uh, from Sydney, uh, 
And then as we move into the 20th century, Tui's then had uh, two stouts, a flag double stout and a stag stout. Resch, the Waverley Brewery, they brewed an extra stout. Toos, Bull Stout. Up in Brisbane, uh, a Red Cross Stout. Toos, Draft Double Stout. Cascade, Invalid Stout. Cooper's Best Extra Stout. Down in Melbourne, Abbotsford, Invalid Stout. Carbine Stout in Brisbane. A rebranding of uh, Balimba Red Top Stout from the Red Cross Stout. Toos, they had a White Horse Stout which uh, transmogrified into sheaf stout. Tui's introduced a oatmeal stout, which we'll talk about later. Uh, Southwark uh, in South Australia, they had an old stout as well. And then in the 1960s, we see Guinness Spring brewed locally by the South Australian brewery. And then Tui's and then Carlton United Breweries brewed Guinness which will bring us to the 21st century and mostly survivors. So Southwark, Abbotsford, Sheaf, Coopers. The Carbine Stout um, uh, failed to stay the course and Guinness Extra Stout uh, was brewed by Lion. So now let's, let's rewind and we'll go to the 1840s. So as I go through each of these eras, uh, we'll look at the historical situation, you know, what was being imported, uh, comparisons, and uh, uh, provide a sample recipe. So the first brewery in Sydney uh, of any note was the Kent Brewery, named after um, uh, the origin of, uh, of the Tooth family in Kent in the UK. And they were selling, selling double brown stout. So just so we've got some context as to um, the number of people that were in Australia and they only counted the British population, not the indigenous uh, population. If you get an idea with those numbers that we're not talking a huge amount of people. So one of the very first things, uh, the first fleet that came in 1788 with the colonization and all the convicts, of course, uh, they had uh, mentioned in the documentation that they had porter. So we get to the, the turn of the 19th century and you've got brown stout porter for the commission officers of the establishment. So there's, there's usually a lot written about IPA, but very little written about stout and, and stout I think was just as important. So we have a look at some of the ingredients in this period. And one of the major things that changed from uh, the use of, of brown malt was to use black patent malt, which was invented by Wheeler in 1817. And one of the things that Tizard said in, in his text that um, if you add black malt, you don't necessarily have to mash black malt. Uh, you could put it straight into the copper and one of the problems was it could stick to the bottom. So I think we, we would have seen, if we'd been alive then, a bit of a change in the flavor profile from perhaps a smoky brown malt uh, to the black paint malt. Now we need to talk about adulteration. It was a big theme in the papers of the day that the, uh, the beer and particularly stout was being adulterated and the newspapers kept on going on about this inferior ingredients. So I think we need to talk through this a bit. So I, I got um, a copy of a book by Alexander Maurice and I was looking for a contemporary recipe. And this has got brown, amber, white, which is pale malt. And it's got three additives, Spanish licorice, Cocculus indicus, and Fabia amara. Now out of those three, the Spanish licorice is probably the most inoffensive thing that was being put in there. 
the cocculus indicus, a fact of an in inebriating nature, and when you get to Fabia Amara, it's a hop substitute. And this was in, in Morris's standard recipes. So looking at Tizard again, he regarded the cocculus indicus berry as being narcotic and providing a fictitious strength. And the bottom line with the Fabia Amara was that it was the same genus as uh, Strychnos and it's extremely bitter. So not a good thing generally, uh, not to be recommended in recreations. So again, I look for a, a contemporary uh, brown stout and this one's from Levesque and he had sample recipes in the back of his book. Uh, and this is very much like a, uh, a, modern, uh, a modern stout, pale malt and black malt. Uh, and there's no sugar used because sugar wasn't allowed in, in the UK until 1847. Well, at least officially. So here's a, an 1844 recipe uh, from uh, an original brewer's diary, which is held in the Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences, commonly known as the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney. And it was one of the earliest records found. Uh, of note in here, is almost 50% raw sugar. Uh, in the colonies, uh, no problem with um, uh, legislations uh, applicable in the UK. Uh, raw sugar was a very acceptable uh, product. So there's, there's a, an idea of what was being produced locally. At this time, of course, in the 1850s, uh, I looked in Trove, the uh, online newspaper archive, and found lots of advertising of imports. So we've got Guinness Extra Stout and Stout from other major UK brewers. Now, there's a bit of a story to this one, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll run you through it. I went um, uh, to Cork uh, two years ago. Uh, to go to the University of Cork, um, uh, University College Cork archives to look at the Murphy's uh, archive. Uh, Murphy's established a brewery in, in 1856 uh, called the Ladies Well Brewery. And in the archive was this book and the, the screen capture there is, is one of the better scribbles that I could interpret. But this book predated the establishment of the brewery. So my Suspicion is that this was a book that belonged to one of the brewers. Uh, maybe he'd come from one of the other uh, cork breweries like Beamish or possibly even Guinness. So I deconstructed that uh, recipe and uh, you can see it's, it's a high dried malt, uh, black mild ale malt and black patent. Uh, some added to the mash and some added to the copper. Uh, and it was very particularly sent to Barbados. So there's uh, an early example of an export porter. And I think we could probably assume uh, with the aging uh, that it might've had Brett in it. So looking at, um, at Tizard again, again for that sort of time period, uh, he regarded uh, black malt and pale malt as a low priced shabby article unless vatted. So I'm, I'm pretty sure we're, we're talking about the, um, uh, the Dublin stout of the period. So he would probably have claimed that West India Porter as, as being under number one. Coming back to Australia again, uh, Guinness uh, were like uh, bass. They, they didn't actually bottle their own products. Uh, they supplied, um, uh, they supplied stout in bulk to bottlers and bottlers took all the risk of uh, bottling, transportation, uh, quality of the product, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the bottlers needed to protect their brands and they typically had brands, uh, and this is the Dagger brand. Uh, and this was uh, registered in 1873. So you can see a very early example of 
of the bottlers trying to protect their brand about uh, from counterfeit uh, local supplies. Now, one of the other uh, additives that was uh, mentioned was the gentian root. Uh, the materia medica, if I read it correctly, is, is basically uh, medical material in Latin, but don't hold me on that. I didn't get to do my, my Latin O level, so I wouldn't know exactly if that's true or false. However, it cropped up in the Albury Stout, of which uh, I looked at the original notes of the brewer. Uh, this again was a relatively straightforward uh, beer. Sometimes they use sugar, sometimes they didn't. I would guess that's down to, to price more than anything else. But of interest was that it was eight ounces of gentian extract in the boiler. Now, gentian is something that uh, the audience might recognize and prizes at the end well bragging rights at least if you know what uh, product that's still available today uses as its base gentian root so hopping hopping of uh, dry hopping of stouts was was quite prevalent uh, not mentioned in the particular log but could well be done with with most stouts Right, moving onwards, ever onwards. So we have the 1880s to the 1910s. Now I thought this was a, a, a good quote because we need to recognize which segment of the market was actually drinking this imported stout. Uh, these are the delicacies of the rich. The poor man, unless the doctor has ordered them, seldom troubling himself with them. So there's your market positioning. Uh, and then we have start of the animals. So we have pig brand stout. And one of the problem here, they, they were being obviously uh, substituted and counterfeiting with local product uh, because there were big margins to be made with this um, higher class product. And then we start seeing adverts where we've got the Bulldog brand uh, from Robert Porter and Co. And they specifically used uh, their branding uh, and they registered theirs in 1876 in, in Australia. So we see a, a, a relevance of using uh, imagery uh, in the promotion of the imported stats. Uh, Southby's has got a very good text and he said that um, Irish porter and stout were generally vatted, uh, watered in the trade cast. So what that means is like a Krausling effect to actually uh, uh, provide the carbonation. And they were very keen on the vatting system to uh, development of those ethers and flavors so much valued. And it was also important that these stouts would need vatting so that they could be safely bottled. So I would suspect they didn't want to have any, any bottle bombs or such. So in effect, we're mellowing out the stout by this, by this vatting period. So the black beers around the turn of the 20th century, amber malt sometimes, black roast malt or caramel. Caramels needed to be of good quality so the color didn't wash, wash out over time or the color drop out. And you had a range from sweet and luscious to more or less dry. So that's, that's an indication of the amount of attenuation. So quite a wide range there. In Australia, uh, the, the, there was uh, uh, a journal called the Australian Brewers Journal. And in there, they quite often uh, advertised uh, products. And in particular, these ones uh, about genuine 
patent malts from the Plunkett brothers in Dublin with a testimonial from Guinness. Uh, I've seen them mentioned in, in several uh, original logs as being used. So that, that was seen as being part of the flavor component that you want to replicate. Now Southby um, did some analysis of uh, stout and porter grist as well. And again, number one is a Dublin stout, black malt and dried malt, hydride malt. Whereas when you get to number three, they're still keeping a level of uh, brown malt and amber malt. And it specifically mentioned that Guinness were dry hopping their export stouts. The ABJ also uh, uh, listed uh, Guinness stouts. So we've got, we've got four different types. We've got foreign, as in foreign to uh, uh, Britain and England at this stage would have regarded Ireland as being part of England. So foreign was anywhere other than the, the British Isles and Ireland. Export, uh, double stout called extra stout and single stout called porter. For the cloning of a Dublin stout, at no instance has the brew possessed the peculiar qualities of distinctive flavor and bouquet of Guinness. And what would be causing this, I wonder? I suspect we have Torrile to provide that English character. As identified by Clausen in uh, 1904, uh, secondary fermentation uh, with uh, multi-strain cultures with Brettanomyces uh, was identified perhaps for the first time. And that would most definitely provide this English, English type character. Now, a quick appreciation to Harry Britton. He emigrated from England to uh, Tasmania. He brewed at the Cascade Brewery for, on a three-year contract. He then went to South Australia and brewed there. And he kept a brewing diary, which is in the archives down in Canberra. And he kept all the details, hot and cold side, absolute legend. He was also an award-winningest brewer as well, with lots of uh, awards for his company. So I think we can say that his 1890 Macclesfield Invalid Stout is, is fairly representative. This one doesn't, to me, appear to be uh, looking to emulate an import as such, because it's dealing with uh, brown malt and black patent, so it's a slightly different um, permutation. Now, in this particular recipe, uh, it had kachiku. Uh, kachiku acacia, clutch tree, is a weed in Australia. Tannin, uh, it's tannic and astringent. So he was using a hop substitute, but with a later log that he recorded, he wasn't using it by 1894. Uh, I didn't bother putting that into the slide because I don't think you possibly want to replicate that. Talking of replication, uh, a lot of these beers left a fairly uh, large amount of unfermentable dextrins. And to achieve these high finishing gravities, the hydride malts, uh, a mild ale malt, Vienna or Marisotto, or, uh, useful. Black patent uh, leaves some unfermentability uh, in the dextrins. Mash high because modern uh, malts are, are very uh, well modified and will convert very quickly. And use uh, a flocculent yeast that doesn't attenuate too well, such like uh, White Labs uh, English Ale yeast. And with a bit of luck, you'll get the sort of finishing gravity that the recipes require. Right, next era. We're going to roll through 1914 onwards and with a specific look at uh, Tui's special stout. I always look for contemporary uh, visits and Frederick Bethel, uh, he visited Guinness's sampling room 
and actually gave some um, tasting notes. So he, he quite liked the, um, the single stout or the porter as most palatable drink. And this is just before the Great War. And the Great War uh, meant there was quite a lot of change within the, the industry in Australia. And uh, the consolidation of the market was such that um, uh, really there weren't that many breweries left uh, after Federation and the Great War, a lot of consolidation. So if we look at one of the impacts of, um, uh, of the Great War, uh, Bulimba up in Brisbane, uh, they, they chose Red Cross Invalid Stout. Now, as we know, the Red Cross is uh, symbolic of the Geneva Convention. And to use Red Cross, which again was a, uh, a marketing symbol uh, around the whole invalid uh, recovery type uh, concept. But there was this act passed that was a regulation uh, that was in, in applied in Australia. And they gave a four year period of grace to um, change any branding that had the Red Cross on it. Uh, with various fines and destroying all the stock. Well, the Queensland Brewery uh, discontinued uh, at the end of this four year period, um, uh, the use of that and they changed it to Red Top Stack. Over in South Australia, we start seeing even more of the uh, import replacement, uh, Cooper Stack. Cooper Stack was very much uh, pale malt, sugar, uh, black paint and malt, about a 7% ABV. So a, a very solid start from the period. With Resch, uh, Resch, they originally had a Dublin start. And you'd, you'd think this would be getting close to infringing uh, on, the, on the Guinness trademark. But what I felt was interesting was they could see, uh, they obviously were looking to replicate that Guinness flavor uh, by using a secondary fermentation. So perhaps there were Brit Britannomyces was lurking in the, uh, in the, in the vats that they were conditioning the stout in. And then we start seeing even more equal to best imported. And in the, <clears throat> in the actual record, <clears throat> well, water doesn't go down well, should have been drinking stout. Uh, the bull stout, particularly in the record, said it had one flask of Britannomyces added, which had been isolated from the Guinness stouts. Lots of flavor and some acidity. However, acetic acid, i.e. vinegar, was a bit of a problem. So we moved to the other major um, Sydney Brewery and Toos as the biggest brewery did a lot of analysis of the competing products and it is quite noticeable here that the uh, the level of acidity uh, by acetic acid was quite high so this would have had a bit of a tang to it and again from the Toos records uh, held at the uh, uh, Auburn Brewery uh, here's a, a derived recipe, a uh, reasonable amount of sugar, as is typical for uh, Australian beers. Uh, very particularly dry hopped, uh, and, and that's, that's typical of the stouts of the period. Now, I've seen a lot that if, if you were to ask somebody that's only familiar with Irish dry stout uh, today, uh, they would say, oh, well, that'll be roast barley, that'll be um, flake barley. Well, that's probably true now, but it wasn't true then. And uh, the, the Guinness Tor brochures that I've seen, I have a 1948 version, uh, which is, um, uses a lot of the earlier uh, detail. Uh, and it talks about roasted malt. By the 1931 version, it was roasted malt or barley. 
So I remain unconvinced that, that roasted barley was much of a thing until the 30s. But who knows what might be out there to uh, have a contrary view. I do think that roast, using roast barley will give you a much more burnt and bitter taste than you would from using uh, black paint and malt. Now I'll just let you read that, or perhaps I can read it to you for those that are just listening with the video off. The value of stout as a beverage and medicinal adjunct. Guinness is of an almost unfailing benefit in the cases of chronic constipation and often enables the patient to dispense with the usual artificial bowel stimulation. I'll just leave that one with you and we'll move on. Guinness did a lot of advertising in the mid 1920s in Australia and we've got we've got bulldogs, we've got beavers, we've got cats. A lot of brand without too much mention of Guinness. And then very particularly these ones were were these had a lot of things about the foreign export stack. Uh, again, working on the invalids and um, looking for the Bulldog brand label. So we move to the 1930s, uh, the, the end of the depression, and we'll look at oatmeal stout in particular. As I said, Toos analysed all the competing products and uh, this is a handy table of the state of play in 1930, where Guinness Extra Stout, which was probably foreign export stout, was at 7.5 uh, ABV, which is not untypical of what you can get export stout today, foreign export. And you can see the other local products there. What I want to point out with Tooth sheaf stout it didn't have any acidity in the analysis of the period so i can see this in in other analysis of the period where there was a move away from uh, the more acidic stouts to a sweeter flavor but not a sweet flavor like you would get with lactose in a in a milk stout just a less bitter flavor and I found evidence in the logs of the use of returned pasteurized beer, bottoms and yeast pressings uh, to blend in with the, the shout in, in, in with the stout to provide a more uh, mellow flavored. And they backed that up with lots of advertising. So healthy, eat with lunch, good before um, going to bed, targeting women. It, they did the whole branding thing uh, in attacking the various segments of the market. But Toos were really reacting to Tui's, the other brewery, where they introduced an oatmeal stout, again, without too much acidity, uh, about 5.4 ABV uh, from the analysis. And unlike uh, the UK of this period, and Ushers is the Ushers in Trowbridge, Wiltshire, not Scotland. So what we've got is a, a 5.3 oatmeal stout from um, Tui's and a 3.6 ABV from Ushers. But 28% malted oats in, in the Tui's one and 1.2 in the Usher's one. So they were okay with um, uh, the Trade Descriptions Act, I guess, because at least they had some in there, but as to its flavor uh, component to the finished product, minimal, I would think. Now it's called oatmeal uh, because uh, uh, the origins were that, that this was uh, an oat malt stout uh, developed by Maclay's in, in Scotland. And by calling it oatmeal, they got around any problems with, um, with naming. 
here we have the uh, oatmeal stout recipe, which has been brewed on numerous occasions and is very palatable. I would recommend it to you. Uh, as is typical of most, most beers uh, from these periods, they use caramel for tinting. So Parisian essence is a type of caramel. You would want to get one that doesn't have any additives in if you choose to use it. Interestingly, Coopers over in South Australia were, were still had a degree of lactic acid in there, so they may have been a lot closer to uh, the imported uh, Guinness Stout than, uh, than their uh, local competitors. And unfortunately, there was nothing much mentioned for the Red Top Stout uh, in terms of acidity, but it was an all malt stout, which is somewhat unusual. The bull stout was still going on and the acidity had dropped off. And then we start seeing some change in the market. Uh, Ian J. Burke with the Cat brand was another one of the export bottlers and Guinness started to take control of their brand and the bottlers and, he, and they took them over. Uh, the book, uh, A Bottle of Guinness Please by David Hughes is highly recommended. It's a good read uh, and uh, I commend that to you. Toos as a large brewer had a large Tide House, Tide House estate and they also supplied bottled Guinness. So for something that was a, a brand that you had to have in your product portfolio, they really sounded the death knell for the own production of Bull Stout because they were using uh, their distributing rights for the Bulldog Stout. And by principal label, I mean the actual Guinness brand. So what we can see here is uh, the transition. This is 1941. Again, all of these things come from Trove. Uh, on the left, it's still Bulldog Guinness Stout. Uh, and that was uh, mid-1941. And then it's moved to a more familiar Guinness is good for you. And Guinness half and half with the Guinness and, um, and bitter mix. So it's moved from uh, the Bulldog references uh, are all gone by 1942. Now there was a, a long period and quite surprising really, um, but there was a long period uh, where Guinness uh, as their export arm uh, tried to interest uh, Tooths and, and other breweries in, uh, in Australia in the local production of the ex what is now an export stout. And after a long dance with South Australian breweries, uh, they uh, started producing uh, export stout locally. But it wasn't FES, it was um, uh, export stout because that was seen to be more the local taste. The contracts then moved uh, to Tui's in 1975 and then to Carlton United Breweries and then back to Lion who, who now own, which is Kieran, who now own uh, Tui's as well. So there was only, only room, I suspect, for one double stout uh, in the market from Lion, which is probably why uh, the, the carbine stout up in Brisbane disappeared. And that brings us to the survivors. So we've got Abbotsford Invalid Stout, Sheaf Stout, both of those are from CUB. Uh, we have Guinness Extra, St Extra Stout, which is uh, Lion and Southwark Stout from Lion. And we have Coopers, the independent um, brewery uh, with their best extra stout 
which which was at a very reasonable uh, 6.8% and it's now uh, down to 6.3%. So the answer to the question, Australian states to best imported, well today they're all local now. So. These are all uh, sources for your reference uh, where I've roamed around the world and found interesting things to put this together. Got lots more information on stouts because I do like a good stout uh, in my books. Uh, Six o'clock brews uh, has a lot of Cooper stouts. Gal brews has got a whole chapter on Murphy's. Uh, my first book, Bronze Brews, I'm busily uh, updating that for a second edition and that will be re-released uh, later this year. So that concludes my, my chat. Uh, happy to take some questions. Fantastic. Thanks, Peter. This is great. I always, I always love listening to and watching your presentations uh, just as a home brewer as well as a beer historian myself. Just this, this interesting uh, um, intermix of history and uh, the technical jargon and such you know you don't, you don't hold back so that's that's great oh, that's wonderful uh well I, I i don't think a question of holding back is um is really in the in, in the modus operandi at all uh so much of the the history is uh, has been written about who took over who and um all that other corporate stuff which is which is nice context, but um, they, they tend not to deal with the important thing, which is the beer. So I, I like to intersperse the beer into the, um, into the history and uh, the resources that are available today are, are great. The, the Trove, uh, the Trove uh, facility, if you like, uh, is, is a great, great source of getting the context of the era. As you can see how the advertising campaigns made a uh, made a difference anyway so what do we yeah, got in the way? questions you think? You probably skimmed past the, the the slide that had your own uh, um, link on there your own website so I, I just added that to the chat box there um, uh, so okay follow up there to visit Peter's own website um, but yeah Liz is asking um, just curious about the, the presence of stouts throughout the UK. Yeah, the um, um, back in, well, oh. what I consider fairly recent times, but then I'm quite old. Uh, I can remember when, when you could get Guinness export stout that actually still had that, um, that bit of bite. So you could have a draft stout in the, in the UK in the 1970s, and it it had it it still had some of that that old aged flavour. Uh, the stuff you get today served super cold is is bland and and to a degree uninteresting. I am wearing my Guinness T-shirt because I've I've done the brewery tour as as every good person should do, uh, which I do recommend if if you're ever allowed out again, uh, <laughs> go to Dublin and. Um, and take the tour. Uh, I I particularly like the um, uh, the advertising, the the Gilroy um, toucans and all that other good stuff. There's a there's a whole layer of that at the thing. But to answer Liz's question, uh, extra stout was was what was um, supplied to to England, uh, so much so that they built a replica brewery at uh, Park Royal Brewery uh, near London. Uh, to produce stout for the local market, because they they didn't own any pubs, they were they were a bit a bit like Bass. Bass and uh, Guinness were always bottled beers that would be available in a pub, uh, and and they supplied um, the Guinness for uh, the local provincial breweries to um, to to bottle. So it most local breweries didn't produce much in the way of stout you you can you can see that they did some oatmeal stouts uh the milk stouts like Mackeson, uh 
they were very popular for a lot of the 20th century, uh, but they weren't competing head on with Guinness because Guinness was Guinness. So you, you, you had to find some other, uh, other niche in the market. Yeah, and, and also just further qualify was this question wondering also even throughout the UK beyond beyond England, like in Scotland and Wales, to what extent there was was stout really popular in those regions of the UK, uh, or not so much? Well, I I, I think the um, I can't really speak for Scotland because um, uh, the times I went to Scotland, I drank heavy, uh, which was McEwan's mostly. Uh, but it, it, you, it comes down to the era again. Uh, stout was exported to the UK generally. It was all over the place. Uh, and you don't see much. Uh, the big London brewers like Whitbread, they still had a London stout, uh, which they party guiled. And it also had oats in, so they were able to do an oat, oat malt stout. They were very creative, but they were only around the edges because um, uh, Guinness was the um, uh, more than the elephant in the room. It would be several toucans. Uh, and they had their marketing thing sorted out. They, they, they had a very simple business model. And, and to a degree, the, uh, it, it's, it's fairly interesting the way that they took a London porter in the 1790s, 1750s, took that to be a thing and only did that. Uh, whereas the, the originating uh, breweries in London in particular, they moved on from porter uh, to milds and pale ales and all sorts of other things. Whereas, if you like, the um, uh, the isolationist part of having it in Ireland, uh, they kept on doing what they were doing because it worked. So, I I, I think it's 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 another topic to delve into that. But uh, I, I I think it's a, a rather unique thing. I I am looking forward to doing. Uh, the um, the West Indies um, uh, export stout uh, at some stage. I'll put that on my brewing roster. Uh, I've I've made some tropical stouts and uh, nothing like a seven and a half percent stout um, uh, to get you going. Now, did anybody pick up um, what uh, gentian is used in? Yeah. Yeah, there were there was a good discussion on that uh, we had going on in the chat room there. <laughs> uh, what was it earlier on? Da, 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 da. We'll find it. Yeah, Megan. Megan mentioned gentians in Bonau. Uh, I confess I had to look up <laughs> look that up, <laughs> but uh, liqueur. But there you go. Absolutely. Yeah, Drew uh, and and myself we suspected. Yeah, more for for bitters. Yeah, I'm gonna stir up yeah. bitters. Yeah. And pink other, gins. Yeah. Pink gins. Wait, when I. When I was but a lad and I worked behind the bar, that was the first time I've ever heard of Angostura bitters. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't I haven't tried yet to um, uh, put a few drops into a. I, I wouldn't recommend uh, brewing a beer and just putting a bottle in. I could be a bit radical, but I, I think it would be an interesting. I haven't done it yet, but I take a take a stout and just gradually dose mm -hmm. with Ang Angostura bitters and and see what sort of difference it makes so yeah. it, it is very um, sharp to the taste so yeah right right yeah i've, I've been i've done uh, some blending with bitters in my homebrew over the years trying to make like a um, a faux uh, medieval style uh, crude ale and, and such but yeah so it's, it's it's a it's it's fun and it adds a real interesting touch to it yeah both in the yeah. in the glass I, and, at, out yeah. of out of all the ones mentioned the angostura and the Spanish licorice uh, are probably the only things I would ever suggest experimenting with. The the other the other ones, they all look downright dangerous to me. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. You know, a question that a lot of people actually, my, um, myself and, and Allison and over uh, Ron on Facebook uh, Live, we're, we're all wondering a similar thing. Um, you used the term earlier on 
uh, um, invalid stout and just wondering the, the origin of that term, invalid and, and carbine stout. Um, can you expand a little bit on the origin of those terms? Uh, I'll do carbine first. Um, carbine was a famous racehorse. Uh, and uh, the Perkins Brewery in, uh, in Brisbane named their stout after the famous racehorse. Uh, I didn't really make that clear. Uh, when I said it had run its course, I was being amusing. Um, well, I thought I was anyway. The, uh, uh, the whole invalid thing, it's that um, uh, other than the, the marketing of, of Guinness gives you strength, is good for you uh, and all those other other things the general feeling was that uh, the medicinal men had recommended it as being good for invalids there was um uh, the famous um the famous quote uh from um uh, the napoleonic War, wars uh where somebody was injured and they wanted a guinness uh, uh, you know, some, some stout, to, and, and this whole thing about having iron in the stout, well, iron and beer is a, a two things that should not come together. Uh, it, it leads to that harsh metallic uh, blood type thing. So I, I think they used a lot of these medical men's references of dubious, presumably they were reputable people, at the time um we're always going on about the health giving nature and you see uh nursing mothers um invalids generally which is why i think um the balimba uh queensland brewery uh chose red cross it had that right connotation you see uh you know the nursing getting better it it's imagery uh there would have been, with these high residual gravities, a good deal of dextrin in the beer. So they would have been a lot chewier. Uh, and on the historical ones that I've brewed, they're a lot more bitter than modern day stouts. But they, they would have been satisfying. They, they would have had a lot more uh, body to them. And you could sort of see how the marketing people would have would have gone with that. And they went with animals that were symbols of, I'm not quite sure about the cat brand, but you know, bulldog, you know, all strength and so they you know, marketing's been with us an awful long time. Yeah. Yeah. Well in, in talking about marketing, you know, I was I was struck when uh, you you showed the uh, it was the, from the nineteen thirties that marketing piece and you called out how they were marketing towards women. And I was wondering, you know, to what extent in the thirties were women seen as consuming consumers of beer or of, of stout in particular, um, or like later on, you also see that there's a lot of marketing towards women as the, the, the primary buyers of uh, foodstuffs for the household. Um, so can you expand a little on that? Yeah, I I think it's very, very male dominated um, uh, society, uh, probably still is. Uh, I I guess what I guess what they saw was uh, after the Great War, there was a and bear in mind there was six o'clock closing, a uh, lot more bottled sales, and stout has always been a very small proportion of the market it would have been uh, a very much a, a niche beer they the, the big brewers today still make stouts is quite surprising because it it is a very niche market uh, so i think there was a lot more bottled beer available uh, the the impetus around the stopping of imports in the great war with uh, import substitutions and that widespread uh, push to say our stout is as good as what you were drinking before uh, that they would have ended up with uh, a perception in the market uh, of of stouts being as good as 
simply because there wasn't much in the way of alternative. But the shift in the in the twenties, where they, what I can see from the acidity figures, is it gone away from that stout with a bit of nick nick nick, you know, a bit of oomph to it, to something a bit um, smoother, not so many edges, uh, and then picking up on it's acceptable to be drinking stout uh, for women. The um, uh, Australian Women's Weekly, which is uh, a major um, periodical in the 20th century. Lots of adverts for, for sheaf stout, oatmeal stout. Oatmeal stout had all the connotations of um, uh, oats are good for you. Uh, again, a fairly smooth drink. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I think they just looked at, well, we're... I've also seen notes in the Tooth archive where they uh, deliberately stopped draft stout to the pubs and were only supplying bottles. And then the impact of Guinness choosing to uh, take control of their own exports basically uh, meant there were, um, I, 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 would, I would suspect that as that was a uh, head office decision, if you like, uh, then the parallels with the US would have been similar. Uh, I can't see that, uh, I don't know whether there were any um, uh, competing stouts to Guinness in the US or it, it was just so so marginal. It's just one of those, you know, noise level things, yeah. No, it's really interesting. So yeah, it suggests uh, with the advertisements and the, the, the woman's journal and such that, that women really truly were, um, a, a, a consuming audience. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, be, because of the take-home nature of bottled beer, I think. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, very good. Um, you know, and and yeah, something that uh, Liz brought up in the chat, and also on my mind too. I'm just you know, when when did stout really become such an Irish thing? You know, when when the, you're talking so much about the, the, the fantastic history of, of of English stout making and in Australia as well, and now people often think of Guinness just, you know, it's completely associated with, with, with Ireland and Dublin, especially. And so when did this, did, is there a time when that shift really seems to, to happen in the public consciousness? Um, I think it's the power of marketing. The, uh, from the 1930s onwards, uh, Guinness really up the ante in the marketing. Uh, there was a, a, a big subsidiary brewing center in Cork where Murphy's and Beamish were, uh, and they'd been brewing, uh, Beamish in particular, had been brewing longer than, uh, than Guinness had really. Uh, and they were very much geared for exports. So it, it's an interesting model where you don't have uh, uh, distribution uh, uh, arrangements for for your exports. You, you you leave it to somebody else to do it. it takes away a lot of risk, uh, but you don't get a lot of control. Uh, but you can see right the way back to the eighteen eighteen early eighteen hundreds, it was it was Guinness, but it wasn't labelled Irish stout. But you had a lot of lot of mentions of Dublin, and Dublin was. Uh, synonymous with um, with Ireland, I guess. So, yeah, I think it's just embedded embedded in there because the the London porter brewers they went off and they moved on. Yeah, I said that before. I I, I generally think that they uh, their mass market had moved on and they left what was I think they would have seen as a niche uh, to Guinness. Uh, and it was only things like. Mackeson and, and oatmeal stacks that were that were different. Yeah, interesting. And so much is really just uh, to some extent. There's there's cultural shifts, but a lot of it is really a, almost a top down marketing kind of approach to what what drives. Well, uh, the, the the whole idea of Irish themed pubs has uh, uh, permeated. You, you can go anywhere. I've been in Irish pubs in um, Kuala Lumpur. Um, Tokyo, uh, I mean, they're knocked out of a mold and you'll get a pint of Guinness or, or something. So, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah. Like Walmart, right? <laughs> well, I didn't say that. <laughs> um, I think we, we have time for maybe one last question here. Um, Drew has posed in the chat um, that, uh, you know, he's, he's curious, wondering um, when those, those curious adulterants <laughs> fell off and, uh, and was it mostly due to the hop expense? Uh, or, yeah, I drove a few of that. I, I, I'm not really sure. the the uh, The textbooks of the day, uh, Southby, I think, uh, said that you should only really use hop substitutes when you couldn't get hops. Uh, so that's uh, mid nineteenth century, uh, and he definitely wouldn't recommend using hop substitutes for dry hopping. Um, but they did give a rate for gentian and the other adulterants. So um, one pound of gentian was worth seven pounds of hops, which is useful for a recreationist because you go, oh, I've got some gentian in here. I'll up the up the hops a bit. Um, but yeah, I I just I just think that they 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 were well from the from the reviews in the UK of the Pure Foods Acts generally that kicked in in the 20th century. Uh, I don't think the brewers would really have um, jeopardized their business by using it, at least. So somewhere during the 19th century, the big guys would have gone, this isn't, this isn't worth the candle. And the small guys might have carried on for a bit, which, and the Albury Brewery was a small brewery, so yeah. Yeah, and top-down pressure and, and, and laws, regulations, um, just, yeah, the expectation that, that hops is really the only uh, yep. added to your, your beers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I fibbed. We, we, we've got one last question I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring in here from Facebook. Um, Ron's asking, uh, was the Britannomyces in the early versions uh, intentional or was this more of a, an accident? <laughs> Uh, for the Australian beers, uh, the uh, later records from the Tooth Archive uh, mention specifically post World War II that their um, uh, that their Britannomyces uh, strains had got too weak for the way that they were fermenting, so they had very deliberately, and that from from the other other stuff that I've I've read from that archive they were cloning Guinness. They, they were not messing about. They were using Brit Britannomyces. I have the original log. I, I would have, I didn't make a song and dance, but I would have done if I hadn't been in the archive in a public place. When I saw the word Britannomyces and a whole flask being added for a stout, it was like, yes. So they, they most definitely uh, were, were, uh, were emulating the Guinness of the day. So yeah, uh, I'm pretty sure it's, it was Brett from there, isolated from their uh, imports of Guinness. Very cool. Thanks, Peter. You know, it's always a pleasure. Uh, I learned so much from, uh, from, from listening to you and, and conversing with you and from all the, yeah, just the great, great comments and questions everybody has on the, on the chat and on Facebook and such. Uh, so That's I just want to. My pleasure. It's my pleasure. I, I enjoy doing it. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, just wanted to quickly highlight for everybody who's uh, listening in here uh, a couple things coming up in the next couple weeks. Uh, on uh, on July fourteenth, uh, something that is uh, uh, I've been very much anticipating a, a a wonderful collaboration that the Chicago Museum. Uh, is involved with, with also the um, Art Institute of Chicago and Half Acre Brewery a collaboration for um, a, a beer called Stacks of Wheat in celebration of the Impressionist artist Claude Monet and the forthcoming exhibition uh, at the Art Institute of Chicago, Monet in Chicago. So coming up on July 14th at 5.30 central time that uh, we will have a virtual happy hour panel discussion. Liz Garby will be moderating that. Liz from the Chicago Museum. 
We'll be moderating that to uh, in, uh, inviting Gloria Groom, who is the uh, curator of the um, Monet in Chicago exhibition at the Art Institute and uh, uh, head of the um, European Painting and Sculpture Department at the Art Institute, and Gabriel Magliaro, who is uh, one of the co-founders and co-owners of Half Acre Brewery. So bringing the three of them together to discuss uh, beer and art <laughs> in the time of Monet in Europe and in uh, Chicago. And then on July 21st, uh, Tuesday, also at 5.30 Central Time, uh, we welcome Liz Williams. Liz Williams is the author and founder of the Southern Food and Beverage Museum in New Orleans. And so she's gonna come and join us for a conversation about um, food and drink down in the, in the Big Easy. So be sure to mark your calendars for those or visit chicagobruseum.org uh, to, to find out uh, uh, and subscribe to the newsletter. Always get the latest up-to-date information. While you're there, if you can, do consider uh, donating to the Chicago Museum or bringing these hap virtual happy hours to you free to create this great space and platform for um, community and uh, sharing and just keeping us all together and in the loop. So Peter, yes, thank you. It's, uh, it is the, the witching hour wherever it may be. So <laughs> never too early, never too late. Um, thanks again, Peter and uh, cheers. Uh, and we look forward to Seeing you again, certainly very soon. All right. Thanks, everybody. Take care.